Welcome to today's action panel. Um, we're about to hear from three wonderful people who have created real change in the world. In a moment, I'll get them to introduce themselves, um, but before I do, I'll just tell you a bit about how this panel discussion is going to run. So I'm here to facilitate, but really what this is about is you guys. This is the opportunity for you to ask these wonderful people all the questions you've been wanting to ask after watching all of our wonderful speakers today. So, um, we've got some roving mics going around the audience, so if at any time during this panel discussion you've got a question, just pop your hand up in the air, we'll send a mic over to you. So, let's get into it. Sandro, you're the founder of Festival 21, so it seems logical to start with you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, thank you. If, uh, there we go. Uh, my name is Sandro, or Alessandro. I'm a medical doctor, Melbourne born and raised. Um, grew up in Victoria, not far from here. Went to Monash, went then to the Alfred, has worked as a doctor, uh, then sort of wafted on, on, on a, off on a path of um, public and global health, did a master's here, a PhD in Europe, found myself in Mongolia collecting a whole lot of data on um, obesity and heart disease, then had an opportunity to move to Harvard for two years, did a postdoc, uh, was an assistant professor in global health. I've worked this year a lot in food, health and sustainability leading into COP21 and with the announcement of this year's Sustainable Development Goals. And six weeks ago, I started a new position with the World Health Organization um, at their headquarters in Geneva. Thanks, Andrew. David? Sure. David Pryor, nice to meet you. Uh, founder of a company called 5AM, which I started in 2010 and sold to a UK business last year and currently the owner of a business in Scotland called the Bladnock Whiskey Distillery, which I've just purchased and uh, we're rebirthing as we speak. Fantastic. Caitlin. Sure. I'm Caitlin Yarnall and uh, I come to you from Washington, DC. I'm an executive editor at National Geographic. Um, my day job, I like to say, is I run the visuals team there. So I have a team of about 50 designers and cartographers and information graphic artists. And then my side project for the last three years is I've been running uh, National Geographic's Future of Food series. So natgeofood.com. I'm originally from California and thrilled to be here. Thanks, Caitlin. Can I quickly add, Amanda, yes. sorry to interrupt. Uh, David has been very modest, but David is also the benefactor patron of Festival 21. So it's thanks to David's generosity. Um, that we're all here today and that this, is, that this is possible and this is possible to be free and that tonight will also be possible and free. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you, Dave. Cheers. So um, now we know a bit about your, what you do in your professional lives, but Festival 21 is a festival about food. So there's a well-known phrase, it was actually made famous by a French food writer in the 1700s, that is, tell me, show me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. So I thought we'd start by asking each of you a question about food. So David, we'll start with you. You're a busy entrepreneur. I'm curious, what do you eat when you're busy and on the go? I remember reading in an article about you that um, when you were just starting 5am yogurt, um, you were doing 23 hour days to get the product out on the shelf. So what, what, were, you eat, what were you eating during those busy times when you needed to stay focused and don't say yogurt? Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, it was yogurt. <laughs> so I was at the factory and I was sleeping at the factory, so it's pretty crazy times. Uh, I don't eat when I'm on the go, I always try and eat mindfully, sit down properly and have a proper meal and even if I'm by myself, just eat properly, so I don't eat in the car or all that sort of stuff. But I, when I'm just trying to get some energy and focus, it's an acai smoothie with all sorts of great stuff and superfoods and chia seeds and all the powders and yeah, everything in that, so that's one of my staples, I'd have that three or four times a week. Yeah, right, so you buy the acai frozen. Frozen acai. And then some 5am yogurt. Yep, blend it up with milk and all the other good things and smash it out. Yeah, it sounds delicious. Yeah. Now, Sandro, um, as you mentioned before... I'm a bit you're nervous full... to say what I eat after <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've got a different question for oh, you, luckily. Thank you. Um, your name gives it away. Your full name, as you mentioned before, is Alessandro De Maio. Yeah. Um, so you obviously have Italian heritage. I do. I'm wondering if you could share with us a favourite family Italian recipe. Absolutely. Uh, I don't even know where to start. First of all, um, in the summer, every summer, we have a small farm. 
um, about an hour's drive from Melbourne, and uh, every summer we get together with all of the extended family and a whole lot of hangers-ons uh, and do the big tomato day, uh, made famous by looking for Ella Brandy, but we've been doing it for a long time. My nonna, we used to do it with her. We grow all our own tomatoes, and we have the big cauldron that we, you know, everyone's there pressing and, and de-seeding and boiling, and, um, and then we have fresh tomatoes, or fresh tomatoes that are, that are preserved, uh, that taste of summer all year round, with uh, the basil and the garlic. Um, and then in the winter time, we do the opposite. We, we find a delicious organic black pig. Sorry, any vegetarians in the audience? Um, and we use every part of it to make the prosciutto, the salami, the pancetta. Um, and so we, we preserve all of our own meats, uh, make the sausages. So those two would have to be my favorite um, family recipes because they're more than a recipe. They're really um, a day and, and a big reflection of my history. Fantastic. Does anyone else wish they're Italian? <laughs> I do. Um, Caitlin, um, obviously running National Geographic um, uh, Nat Geo Food, you're taken all over the world. So I'd like to know what is the most adventurous food you've ever eaten? Oh, wow. Um, one time I was in a small village in, in Mexico and uh, it was outside of, well, it was in the state of Michoacan. And there was this whole village and they were excited that I was there and they had killed a goat. So we all sat it down to eat this goat and they said, we're bringing you the, the plate of honor. And I look at it and it is just a skull with some meat hanging on it. And I, said, I, I turned to the guy next to me, the only one who spoke English and said, what am I supposed to do with it? And he said, just suck the eyeball out of the eye socket. What did it taste like? I don't really know, because it just went straight down. <laughs> just get that down as fast as I could. <laughs> when you have a whole village looking at you, it's amazing what you can just... Wow, I would challenge anyone here to top that. <laughs> okay, so we've learned a bit about all of you and what you eat. Um, now it's down to business, so we'd love to know a bit more about your career to date and how you guys all got to where you are now. Um, so we've got a lot of young people in the audience, obviously, today, um, who are just starting out. And I know that um, a lot of young people, I know for me, myself, we all have a job that we have to do when we're young that we hate. And at the time we think, why am I doing this? What is the point? How is this ever going to do anything good for me? So I'm curious to hear from all of you about a job that you did when you were younger, that at the time you thought, I hate this, I don't know where this is gonna lead me. And now when you look back, you recognize that it was beneficial long-term for your career. Um, David, we'll start with you. I worked at uh, Meyer and Country Road and all these little retail jobs uh, down in Frankston. I was living on the peninsula and uh, it was bloody boring and there were times when I just thought, I really don't want to be here. But, you know, I look back now and think what a great uh, grounding it was in dealing with customers, mm -hmm. dealing with issues, uh, engaging with people. Just a really fantastic way to sort of, uh, you know, especially the art of sales, which is fundamentally most people are in the art of sales, doesn't matter what business you're in. So yeah, it's a great grounding. Mm. Caitlin, what about you? Um, I never actually, I'm very fortunate, I never had a job I hated. But one job, I, I coached um, high school boys swimming for a lot of years, which was uh, very challenging. And let me tell you, if you can manage a team of uh, like 16 to 17 year old boy swimmers, it's really easy to then manage advertisers and editors mm -hmm. and everyone. It's the same strategy. <laughs> so that one, good grounding. That's a good one, yeah. <laughs> Sandra? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm similar. I haven't had a job that I hated, but um, I think my first job, which was working as a receptionist um, in a medical center owned by my father, um, I think, you know, for me at the time, I was thinking this is a way to make money to travel and enjoy holidays in Europe and Asia and see the world. Um, but actually, I probably got just as much out of the holidays in Europe as I did out of the, the job in the medical clinic. Um, you get to see, you know, not because working as a doctor, you get to see people, but they treat you in a different way when you're the doctor as they do when you're the receptionist. Um, when you're the receptionist, you get to see the kind of real raw human uh, I suppose you get to see people who are very vulnerable, who are often very angry, but not because they're bad people, because they're frightened, because they're frightened for the person that they're bringing in. Um, and, and so you get to see um, the, the, the broad spectrum of society, you get to see the broad spectrum of health, of age, 
Um, you get to see some of the challenges that our community are facing. Uh, yeah, so I think I, I definitely learnt a lot more from being on the true front line of medicine and public health um, as a receptionist. Do so you think that sort of cultivated a sense of empathy? Absolutely, you yeah. And you and you you start. I mean, you, we all talk about you know the social determinants of health, the the way in which we're kind of born and grow and educate and work and age and how that you know the opportunities that are afforded to us or not and how that influences our health. It's it's one thing to read it in a book. It's another thing to to see it in patients, um, you know, a lot of patients coming in and seeing the similarities between people, you know, starting to see, um, uh, I suppose, patterns that, you know, it seems to be the same demographics of people who are affected by poor health and chronic disease and not able to get the health care that they need or seeing a lot of young kids coming in with issues that were really challenges of adults, of, of um, chronic, you know, chronic disease, diabetes, obesity, things um, that, you know, start to make you think about, well, what are the health problems in our community? Um, who's really affected the true human face of, of that um, outcome rather than reading it about it in a book? Or as a doctor, we're very privileged because people treat us in a very different way to how they treat the nurses, uh, the, you know, the, the allied health staff, who all have a, an incredibly important role, but s for some reason we're kind of treated slightly differently and sheltered from a lot of that raw kind of human um, angst and, and, and concern. Hmm. Okay, now I think I've asked a couple of questions now. It's time to sort of pass over to the audience. Have we got any questions out there? Have I got any hands up? Hi, um, so I just finished my studies in health science arts, so I've got a bit of a social science background and I do health promotion. And one thing that I've learned about in my studies in sociology is for a long time to access um, an audience in promoting health, it's through the GP, through the doctor's clinic. And I was really interested to hear what you were saying just then, Sandra, about how when you were a receptionist you found that that was a good way to see lots of different areas in health. Um, but when you are promoting health, you want to get beyond just the medical GP when people are sick. So I'm wondering like, what you would say, because I still think it is now common that there's often people who, when they have problems with health or want to find out more about health, will instinctively think the best place to go is the GP. But mm. there are so many services out there that we would all know about that people still don't really find out about elsewhere. And I'm just wondering how you think it's best to get word out about different services in health promotion. I mean, I think health, um, the narrative around health and healthcare and health literacy, um, you know, 30 years ago it was formed by the medical community, by the public health community, by doctors and by parents probably. Um, nowadays it's formed by everyone and I think it's formed in part by all three of us on stage. I mean, if you look at 5am um, yogurt, it's not just a product, it's a lifestyle and it's really almost health promotion packaged with a product. Um, if you look at National Geographic and the work they do as well with their infographics and really, really trying to take big data and, and the challenges that we face as a global community when it comes to health and package it in a way that is actually enjoyable and beautiful to look at, they're, they're both examples, I think, of kind of a 2.0 um, of modern health promotion. I think we need to, you know, as health promotion and public health are not really, you know, I, I would say the big gains in, in health uh, and life expectancy last century weren't, weren't brought about by doctors and they won't be brought about by doctors in the next century. Um, you know, they were brought about largely by engineers in the last and probably they'll be brought about by these two more than me in the 21st century. Um, and I think it's as the healthcare system and as public health, it's understanding that, it's embracing um, the de democratisation of media, um, embracing the fact that everyone has an opinion on health but, but seeing that we have an important role, it's a different one but it's still an important role. Um, and working with platforms like National Geographic, the work that they've done with um, FAO, the United Nations Platform for Agriculture, around food and food security is a really great example of where two organisations can come together, take data, take then the translation of that data and turn it into something that very much is informing and building the health literacy of populations, um, you know, with the traditional sectors, but 
in a, in a totally different world today. So I'm interested to hear from Caitlin about the collaboration between FAO and National Geographic. Could you just take the audience through how that's worked? Sure, of course. Um, when we decided we wanted to first do a food series, it really it came from a place of an extension of a dialogue with our readers. So we had uh, two years before done a year-long series on population that we called 7 billion, and that was the year that the um, world hit 7 billion people. We'd done a special issues on on energy and on fresh water, and food felt like the next natural extension. So when it became my baby, um, I come from very much a, a, a data background, and I thought, you know, I need to get on a plane to Rome and get access to the best food and agricultural data in the world, so that's the FAO. So I was able to set up some meetings. We got there. Um, we ended up signing a very formal memo of understanding. Um, but the, the value of it, on, from my perspective, has been um, we have an unlocked API key to all of their data. Um, and that goes from you know, World War II to today. And it's everything from imports and exports and prices and uh, animal health on every single commodity. Um, so it was access to that data and then access to the experts that know what to say about that. So it's one thing, you know, in this world of big data and information graphics to just pull numbers and chart them and say, look, but that's sloppy journalism. You have to actually talk to an expert and someone who can say, is this pattern I'm seeing correct? Have I done my statistics correctly? And then can you help me explain it? Mm -hmm. And so that's been powerful to have that access and to work that way. Um, so from my perspective, that's been great. It's also got me into and got us into a lot of um, you know, diplomatic type settings that we wouldn't have otherwise. And then from their perspective, I think what they have really gained is you know, who here know, know well you probably do, you're in a uh, food audience, but knew what the FAO was, right? It's this kind of, seen as a dusty organization locked up in Rome, but they inform everything we do. And so for us being able to put together videos and photos and graphics and you know, source them and cite them has been a great communications tool and it's been a win-win. Yeah, you've essentially taken what to most people is quite dry information and put it in a format that is appealing and um, that people notice, which I think is fantastic. David, um, what do you think about, you've obviously taken a yogurt brand um, from nothing to being a huge multinational um, yogurt brand now, um, and you're doing the same with um, a whiskey company in Scotland. Um, what do you think about branding of public health initiatives and food initiatives around the world? Do you think it needs to be approached more commercially like you would a business? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, and I'll get to talk about this tonight, but there's a coming together of uh, both the not-for-profit and the for-profit space, and I think that's just the way forward. So when you're building a brand, the first thing you look for is engagement with the consumer, engagement with your end customer. If you can't reach them in a way that they can engage with and they feel inspired by or moved by or connected by, then it's very hard to build a brand. Uh, in our space, or in the yogurt space, or in the spirit space, or whatever, we find the large organisations that have become very sort of... Uh, hierarchical and difficult and slow, find it very difficult to build brands now mm -hmm. because they've lost some of that essence, they've lost that storytelling ability. And I think it's the same with, uh, with whether it's in the uh, profit space or the not-for-profit space. As you become big and encumbered and you've got all these things going on, it's very, very hard to remember what it is you're engaging about. So I think that storytelling ability and the emotional connection is the same whether it's a business or whether it's an NGO. Mm -hmm. Have we got any other questions out there in the audience that anyone would like to ask? Can I see any hands? Yep. Hi, um, my name is Tony Tan, um, and I have a question for David. Um, I think there's a lot of young people in this audience who um, really want to start something and they want to change the world. Um, and personally, I'm passionate about helping international students transition to their lives in Australia. So, David, I just wanted to get an idea of when you were starting 5am, um, um, how, what were some of the problems that you faced and how did you overcome them? <laughs> so, thanks. Uh, you know, good question, but unfortunately business is non-stop problems. 
um, from the day you start, I suppose, until the day you sell, and even after you sell, there's, there's still lots of issues and challenges to face. But I think what sets uh, business people apart from their peers, and I, I guess in every walk of life, but is how you deal with those challenges and those issues. I mean, we had, we had a 12-month period to launch uh, 5am and get it to the market because we had a launch date with Woolworths. Uh, we were looking to take organic food into the major distribution channels. And in the end, we just had run out of time. So that's what I was saying before. In the end, I moved down to the plant and I was sleeping in the offices because there were the time to drive home and come back and it was just, we weren't going to make it. So you have times in your life and in, certainly when you're building a business and you're leading a team where you have to show incredible commitment, uh, poise if possible, uh, and, and not forget the vision that you're building upon in order to bring anything to life. So business really brings that home because not only are you um, trying to establish and launch something, sometimes it's with, in our case, it's with the family home on the line and with many millions of dollars owed to a bank. So the consequences of getting it wrong are pretty bloody serious. That has a good way of focusing the mind and the energy. So, you know, I think if I look back on the 5am journey, the, probably the defining moment was just in that period of launching and probably the way I dealt with myself and my staff in getting the product to the market and never losing sight of the vision was probably the biggest thing. So I think if you've got that vision and that energy, then you've got to go for it. That um, latest question um, leads me into one of the questions that I've got to ask, and it's about self-doubt. So obviously a lot of people in the room are, are just starting out with different ideas and different things that they want to do. And um, I think self-doubt, particularly when you're young, is something that you experience. So I'm curious, from the three of you, who are obviously all very successful in your chosen fields, um, do you experience self-doubt? And if so, how do you deal with it? Caitlin, we might start with you. Well, I think the, the second you start, you stop questioning and doubting, you're, mm. you're done, right? I mean, you, I think anything worth putting forward, and for me, whether that's a big story or restructuring a team, if it doesn't scare you a little, it's probably not big enough and bold enough. Um, it's, if, it, if it doesn't make you nervous, it's predictable. Um, and so I think doubt isn't really the word. I mean, you have to be confident in your, your ability and your vision in the people you surround yourself with. Um, but it's okay to feel scared. It's okay to not know if it's actually actually going to work. I mean, risk is a word that's tossed around a lot, but it's it, it's vital to success. I think. Mm. Oh, I think so, Sandra. Yeah. You've just moved over to Stockholm. Geneva. Right? Geneva. Yep. Sorry. No, that's right. Um, and so obviously you've packed up your whole life to go and start something new. That's yeah. a huge decision. Um, have, you, have you ever had any doubts about that and how have you yeah, managed that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people often think that you don't have, I mean, people assume sometimes that I don't um, have doubt, you know, about my abilities or don't have insecurities. Um, and that's absolutely not true. Um, I have, you know, lots of, lots of times where I take a moment and, you know, wonder if um, I've got the ability to do what I'm doing or, um, you know, feel worried about the opportunities that you're taking on. Um, I remember when I became a doctor, I was petrified the first day and looking back, I'd be petrified of anyone who's not petrified being a doctor the first day. Um, you know, I think the mixture of fear and, and humility and um, also having a sense of pride at your ability is, is a really important balance. Um, there's actually a phenomenon called the Denning-Kruger effect. Um, because, and I asked, because uh, I always thought that, I always had this fear that I'm going to wake up tomorrow and everyone's going to know that I'm a total fraud and I actually don't know anything. Um, particularly taking this job in Geneva, um, there's been a few eyebrows raised at a 30-year-old getting this job um, at the headquarters of WHO. And um, I have, I've always had this fear. And so I was in the car about a month and a half ago with probably the smartest person I know. He's doing, working in eugenics in China. He's learned the Chinese language in like four months to do it. And um, he's, anyway, he's a, he's a genius. Anyway, we were in the car together and I said, um, just by any chance, do you have this feeling that you're going to wake up tomorrow and everyone's going to know you're a total fraud and actually you know nothing, um, but everyone else is really smart? And he's like, yes, Andrew, that's called the Denning-Kruger effect. 
And I was like, well, you've just proven that you're a genius. Thank you very much. What is the Denning Kruger <laughs> effect? And he said that, you know, the more, um, the better you get at something, the more you underestimate your own ability and overestimate everyone else's. Um, and it's an anthropological phenomenon. And uh, it doesn't make me feel better when I'm awake at night wondering if anyone will turn up to Festival 21 tomorrow. Um, or where if, you know, if, uh, I'm going into a meeting with 27 member states and I'm worried they might work out that I actually have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, it turns out that I do most days. And people did turn up, by and, <laughs> which is great. And, and we've got people more people coming up, tonight. Yeah. So, so I, I would say to, to everyone, you know, every, actually everyone has that feeling. Um, everyone has that fear. And even the most successful, the people who I admire the most, and actually Eric Jensen, who's speaking tonight, will talk about this exact issue. Um, failure is, is not something to be feared. It's something to learn from and, and you know, enjoy almost. Um, it's what makes us who we are, and it's what forms the success of most people. Um, and always remember that everyone is worried that everyone else knows five times more and is 12 times as smart. OK, good. That's reassuring. <laughs> um, have we got any other questions in the audience out there? I think there's one up the back over here. Um, I have a question for David and Caitlin. So I'm an agricultural student, and my name is my name's Marianne Haynes. I'm an agricultural student. And um, I work in an organic cafe. Sorry, can you just speak into the mic? Sorry. Um, I work in an organic um, grocery and cafe, and I'm an agricultural student. Just in terms of um, your organic industry and being able to sustain and feed everybody, especially as our population grows, do you think uh, the organic market only has a potential to remain a niche because in some aspects it can't produce as much food as other methods? Right. Was that a question for me? Mm. Yeah. I think, yeah. David, yes. Uh, no, not at all, actually. One of the biggest things with 5AM was our desire to make organic food available to mainstream shoppers because... You know, in Australia, if you go to the US and Europe, you find organic food available in their big, big box stores. So as a result, the differential in price between organic food and non-organic food is always sort of less than 10%, normally around five. In Australia, it's quite often 50% because organic food is such a niche, you have to go to an organic food store to get it. The cost to serve those channels is extremely high. So it's always niche, it's always elitist and it's extremely difficult for mainstream consumers to access organic food. So with 5AM, one of my fundamental drivers was to make organic food available to um, mum and dad shoppers. So by going through Coles and Woolworths, which most organic guys go, oh, you don't want to do that, that's selling out the organic industry, which is absolute crap. All you're doing is making it available to more people. So we went through that and we went through and we, we took a volume approach to bringing a premium product to the market and the price differential between ours and the closest competitor uh, was less than 5%. So I think the reason why 5AM went from you know, zero to $50 million sales in five years was because of, well, it was a great, great tasting product, but it was also that price differential. Uh, and in terms of yields, I mean, year on year, every year the organic farmers and the outputs are getting much, much closer to non uh, to whatever you want to call the other, um, you know, to conventional law. Um, so there's no, I mean, our organic dairy farms were producing almost the same number of litres per head of cattle and infinitely better quality, of course, uh, than the conventional farms. Just to add to that, the, the case study for the United States, um, you know, people like to, to beat up on Walmart as a company, but when Walmart decided to carry organics, it... Yep was the biggest thing for the organic industry globally. Because all of a sudden, the store that feeds more people in maybe the world, but definitely the United States, became the biggest uh, supplier of organics and the biggest purchaser of organics. And they could buy at such volume and had such um, heft in the marketplace that the organic producers, whether it's, you know, raw vegetables or it was a more um, packaged food had to get there if they wanted to be into Walmart. So, I mean, there is a case business study for that. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, just to finish on that, the, the thing that we faced is that the mass brands are constantly dumbing down their products, so they're putting more and more fillers and manufacturing aids and all this stuff in there to make everything go faster, run through their production lines quicker and get it out onto the shelf at the lowest possible price. And consumers often are not engaged about that or educated about that. So they'll go, well, this is three bucks and that's five bucks, I'm going to take this. It all sounds great. But what we found was through social media, especially the ability to have conversations around reading the labels and reading the package and what do all those numbers mean and compare that to our product or many other great brands that were out there, um, consumers were becoming much, much more aware and informed. But that whole thing around scale and volume, that if you keep being scared of dealing, doing business with the big guys, mm -hmm. then we're always playing in that marginal game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and then I'll stop without this, but the, mo the Walmart model, Walmart didn't wake up one morning and say, you know what, we want to do organic foods because we're, we care about organic foods. They did it because there was consumer demand, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it was, made good business sense to them. I mean, they're, they're not a small player. And so I think, you know, there, there's a role and a voice for each of us that um, capitalism works when people pay with their money, with, you know, they vote with their dollars. Yeah, organic is selling now. Yeah. People want it. Now, I think we've got one, uh, time for one more question, if there's somebody. Um, I'm curious to know from probably each one of you, what was it that drove you to either take up your career path or in David's case to create the business that you created? And how does that connect to what is really important to you as a human being? Caitlin, I'm interested to hear from you about Nat, Nat Geo Food because I know that's been your sort of baby. My baby, yeah. Well, you know, why I wanted to work at National Geographic I think is pretty self-explanatory. Like if you want to be a journalist or work in the field of visuals, it was the place. I grew up with it. So I got in the door there and I never thought I'd be there as long. I've been there 10 years, right? I never thought I'd be there that long, but it is very addicting to be in the power, or to be in the presence of incredibly smart and turned on people. And that's what keeps me going back every day. Yes, we have the best content and we have, still have, uh, you know, knock on wood, very, healthy budgets, but it's, it's my coworkers and the people that I get to work with every day. So um, that's the reason why initially I started there and I've stayed there. Um, in terms of food, you know, food had always been a, a, a passion of mine. I, I loved it. Um, I come from a long line of cooks and uh, my dad fishes every day and brings it in and my parents grow all their own produce. And to be able to link that love with these big issues that we cover in the magazine and that keep me up at night, things like population, fresh water, climate, to put that all together and then PS have, you know, 120 million people looking at it, that's pretty special. David? Yeah, you know, I think for me it was about, um, and we'd sold our family business when I was in my mid-30s and I had lots of different choices available to me. Looked at many of them, one was becoming a yoga teacher and moving to the Talabudra Valley in Queensland and I think that if I was going to go into business I wanted to tick a whole lot of boxes. Um, so I wanted it to be a, a space I was passionate about, a healthy product, good for the environment. Uh, and be able to, to build a brand, so I'd studied branding when I was at uni and um, it's sort of my key passion is that whole engagement with the consumer and the conversation you can have. Um, so 5am sort of ticked all those boxes, but things change and evolve as you move along as well. And that was a great five year journey. Um, and now we've been in this situation where we've been able to change um, that path. And so I've set up a not for profit, which I'll speak about tonight, and bought this Scotch whisky distillery in, in the south of Scotland. And we've got an incredible opportunity there to rebirth this 200-year-old uh, distillery that's basically fallen into dis disrepair and has become a, um, not, no longer a source of employment for this town. So it's an incredible project. It's so exciting. And uh, also launched a brand called Pure Scott. And it's interesting going from organic food to alcohol, of course, because the obvious question is, where's the consistency in that? But if you look into the Pure Scott brand, it's a lifestyle brand again. So we're saying to people, it's fine to have a drink of alcohol, but do it in a balanced way, do it in an educated way, do it with awareness. So we're bringing enjoyment 
with awareness and balance as part of the actual brand DNA. So we get to continue that story of brand building that we had with 5AM through a much more conventional uh, and in some ways challenging product. But, um, so that's what's, that's what's engaging me at the moment and I suppose guiding my, my path is just keeping that vision and that passion uh, aligned with my values and, and, you know, and what excites me. Sandro? Um, I think for me, and, and a message I'd love you guys to take home, um, first of all would be that key to my career so far, I'm very early on, you have to you know, keep in mind, but um, key to my career would have to be great mentors um, who have really helped me and shaped my career. Um, my mentors, you know, key people in my life who are out in the exhibition space or, um, you know, around, around the world uh, have made today possible. Um, and the, the decision to go into public health was actually shaped by um, a 15, or, yeah, 15 minute chat with Rob Moody about 15 years ago that he's forgotten and I'll never forget, not because he's a, um, a forgetful person and doesn't cherish our friendship, but more because he meets with probably 500 million people uh, a week. Um, but, but having incredible mentors who take the time to you know, offer opportunities, um, give you advice, uh, and have helped me shape my career. I think that's really important, and I try to do that now a lot with um, other people. And I think the other thing is just taking opportunities and doing them because you're passionate and because you believe in what you're doing, not because you're trying to get something. Um, that's, you know, that philosophy that was very much passed down from my grandparents and my parents, I think, has put me in really good stead of, of being, um, my, you know, using the moral compass, using what what are my values, what do I believe in, what am I passionate about, like, you know, what David talked about, and then using that to work out what to do, taking opportunities as they come up, and, and then using that passion to, I think, capitalise on those opportunities. Um, so I think, you know, those two, you know, those two things have been really key in my life so far. Yeah, well, we're actually out of time, unfortunately, but um, I'd like to end on one final question. So we've got a lot of really keen young people in the audience. Um, if they want to go out today and create real change, what one piece of advice, and I want one sentence, <laughs> will you leave them with today? Caitlin. Oh, to go first. Um, don't be afraid to take risks, M dash, because it'll still be on something. <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to take risks. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to copy Sandra, I, I, I firmly believe this. Find the very best mentors you can. Mm. And, and, and whether they are in your professional space, or it is your next door neighbor, or it is um, you know, the, the guy who's selling you your milk every morning, find those mentors who can help you professionally, but also personally. Uh, find people who seem happy and ask them how they got there. Hmm. David? Easy. Believe in yourself because society is absolutely programmed to tell you you're going to fail. Uh, and, you know, with all of my business, uh, businesses that I've started, for every 100 people, 99 people have said you're absolutely crazy. It's impossible that that's going to work. So you've just got to believe in yourself. Believe it's in yourself. absolute number one thing. Sandra. I agree with those two, so I'm going to say the one maybe that's left, and that's um, respect and work with your peers. Uh, I think, you know, the people in this room, you guys are going to be, if you're not already, shaping the future, shaping Melbourne, shaping Australia, and shaping the world. And I think, you know, never forget that when you're early in your career, that the people around you, your peers, um, are your best allies and working with them. I know it sounds simple, but very often we fall into this trap of somehow being competitive with each other. And I think that's you know, a fundamental uh, flaw in maybe partly our culture or maybe it's just our generation or maybe it's neither. Maybe it's just sometimes med students and doctors. Um, but working with each other, respecting each other, involving each other, cherishing and valuing the skills that everyone has because it's only through working together as a group um, and creating sort of that movement, I know it's an overused word, but creating that mass that, 
projects like this are possible. This is not me, this is a huge team of people. Um, that projects, I would guess, even like 5am are possible, and certainly, um, you know, organisations that change the world like National Geographic are possible. I hope that's okay to say that for, you, for both of you, but I've spoken to you enough to, to hopefully reflect that. So I think really valuing and working with the people around you. Ment you know, have great mentors, mentor others, but value your peers, respect your peers, work with them. They're the cohort with which you're going to actually change the world. Mm. Just awesome pieces of advice to finish on. Now, um, unfortunately, as I say, we're, we're out of time, so please, round of applause for our esteemed panellists. Thank you. Thank you.